Most of you know that I had the opportunity to serve at the congregation in Baton Rouge, Louisiana for three years. The church has a long history of uh, a connection to southern Louisiana. Howard Marshall, I think, is from southern Louisiana. Randy Jay is from southern Louisiana, which, you know, makes me wonder why we're not having a crawfish boil anytime soon. It seems like that's something we need to have. One of the greatest things about living in southern Louisiana, besides the delicious food, were the countless stories that I heard about two infamous Cajuns named Boudreaux and Thibodeau. Reverend Boudreaux was the part-time pastor of the Boondock Bible Church. And Pastor Thibodeau was the minister of the Backwoods Gospel Church located directly across the street from the other. One day they were both standing out by the road in front of their churches, each pounding a sign into the ground as quickly as they could. The sign read, The end is near. Turn yourself round now, afore it be too late. As soon as the signs got into the ground, a car passed by. Without slowing down, a driver leaned out of his window and yelled as loud as he possibly could, You bunch of religious nuts! Then from the curve in the road, Boudreaux and Thibodeau heard tires screeching and a big splash. The Reverend Boudreaux yells at Pastor Thibodeau across the road and asks, Do you think maybe the son should just say, Bridge out? <laughs> now because I'm a seminary educated minister, y'all just now getting it somebody. Because I'm a seminary educator of my ministry preaching from mainline city pulpits, I've always sought to differentiate myself from the so-called religious nuts that are in our world. The repent or be sent, turn or burn, reach for the sky or fry, get saved or get microwaved. Style of preaching has never been a part of my repertoire. Thus, when I preach a passage of scripture like our gospel lesson this morning, I've steered away from any interpretation that sounds like what Jesus might be actually saying here. The end is near. You better turn yourself around now before it be too late. For example, I've used this passage as a wonderful opportunity to have a deep theological discussion on the problem of evil, theodicy. I've said that here in this passage we have two basic types of evil being pointed out. There's natural evil and there is personal evil. The Tower of Siloam, I have said, represents natural evil. In this fragmented world, sometimes tornadoes and floods destroy property and sometimes take lives. And the Galileans massacred by Pilate represent personal evil. In this broken world, sometimes a broken person will grab a gun, walk into a peaceful place of worship, and start shooting everyone in sight. And with Jesus' very emphatic response here, no, I tell you. Jesus is saying that God does not will such tragedy because of human sinfulness or for any other reason. In this imperfect world, sometimes bad things happen to good people, and there is no divine explanation for it or purpose for it. However, maybe to avoid sounding like a religious nut, I have actually missed the simple message of this passage which is the end is near. You better turn yourself around now before it be too late. Maybe the point that Jesus is really trying to make here is, unless you repent, you will perish. You have a little more time, but unless you start producing some figs, start bearing some fruit, 
at least sprouting a bloom or two, you're not going to make it. You're going to die. But Dr. Banks, that sounds too much like the hellfire brimstone sermons that those country backwood churches. And, and, and you know, we moderate, mainline, sophisticated churches, we're way too smart for that. However, I've got this feeling here through the studying of this passage that Jesus is arguing that we might be too smart for our own good. Luke tells us that people had gathered together. And then they started doing what people do best when they gathered together. Even in the church, they began to gossip. Especially about the sinfulness of those people the sinfulness of others. Those people who had this tower tragically collapse upon them. Sadly, I believe this may be the only reason that some people go to church these days. To hear about the sins of those other people. Those who are not in the church. They go to church to feel good, to feel religious, superior, righteous. And Jesus is emphatic here. No, I tell you. It is as if he is saying, you better stop judging your, your neighbors and start looking at yourselves. Stop worrying about the speck that's in your neighbor's eyes and focus on that log that's in your eyes. Look, bad things happen in this world. People die. It's not a matter of degrees of rightness or wrongness, sin or sainthood. Everyone dies. And one day, you're going to die. So you better repent. You better change. You better turn yourself around now before it be too late. this story about a fruitless fig tree. And the moral of the story is simple. Bear fruit or die. Reverend Shannon Blizzard believes this text is begging the church today to ask, what, what are we doing to bear fruit in this world? To bloom where we have been planted. She says that far too many congregations are merely existing like a barren fig tree, wasting the soil. There are no signs of any fruits, no promise of any blooms. These churches exist primarily to get together and sadly do what people do best when they get together, to gossip to talk about the sinfulness of those outside the church, to lament about the moral decay of society, and, the, and to pine for the return of the good old days. And many of them have lost hope. They've grown too weary, too worn down, too disheartened to invest any energy, creativity, and passion to share the good news of Jesus with a broken and hurting world. While many congregations do provide a place to take care of one another, to look after one another, they have no sense of mission whatsoever to be the body of Christ that is sent into the world bearing fruit. She says, think of it this way. Fruit always grows outward from the plant into the light so too a healthy church grows outward. Several years ago, my mother gave me a Rose of Shannon root. She told me to plant the root, and it would grow into one of the most beautiful plants in my yard, with its flowers blooming all summer long. Well, after planting the root, the plant did grow, but it did not produce a single bloom that summer. I called Mama and I said, Mama, I think you must have given me a dud. She said, oh no, it, it's not a dud. 
It just needs some TLC. You, you might need to dig around it, give it a little fertilizer. You may even need to dig it up altogether and plant it in better soil. Make sure it's in soil that can soak up the water and is growing in a place where it can get some good light. Well, as always, I've always tried to do what my mama tells me to do, so I ended up transplanting the plant to a spot with better topsoil. I kept an eye on it, I watered it, I cared for it, and the next year, just like Mama said, it produced the most beautiful blooms all summer long. From the short time that I've known you, it is obvious that the that God has given this church many good gifts. The talents and resources that you have, although you are small in size, are astounding. There's not a single dud in this room. And because of that, God expects us to be fruitful. God expects our church to bloom. I believe Jesus is asking us to take a lesson from the barren fig tree, to bloom and bear fruit. And to do that is going to require some work, some sacrifice. We may need to dig around, put out some fertilizer, even transplant a thing or two. It may take some cutting back, some pruning, some shaping, some nurturing. And that's scary. That's difficult. It's risky. But Jesus says it's the only way to life. The only way to bear fruit and nourish this world. Eddie Hammett, a good friend of mine and church consultant, loves to say that Christians need to stop going to church and start being the church. I believe he's talking about the difference between a church that is inward focused, therefore barren, and a church that is outward focused, therefore bearing fruit in the world. Hammett writes, going to church is routine and easy. Being church in the world is challenging, difficult, and calls for prayerful intentionality. Going to church keeps us safe. Being the church makes us uncomfortable and challenges us to be salt, light, and leaven. Going to church is familiar. Being the people God as church is unfamiliar to many and overwhelming to most. But may we press on in the faith. As much as I may not want to sound like a countryfied religious nut, from out in the boondocks somewhere, and only speak articulate, sophisticated words that make us comfortable from this mainline pulpit in the middle of our city. Maybe what we really need to hear is that the time is coming. The day is approaching. As it was for that barren fig tree, there's going to be an accounting what we really need to hear is that we must bear fruit as a church or die. What we really need to hear is the end is near, so you better turn yourself around now before it be too late. May we use the gifts that God has given us to press on in the faith. Step up and out in our discipleship. Do the hard work of getting out the fertilizer and the shovel, doing some digging, getting our hands dirty if we have to, to produce something sweet in this community. For in the end, when our time on this earth is done, the world will be more or less kind, gentle, Loving, joyous, peaceful, generous, 
and good because of our presence here. And we alone choose. There's a big world out there. A world that is thirsting and hungering for the love of God. May we go out and bloom, bearing fruit in the image of Christ. May we pray to God. Oh God, forgive us for sometimes softening your words to make them more comfortable for our itching ears. Grant us a spirit of selflessness where we are selfish, a spirit of courage where we are afraid, and a spirit of urgency where we are complacent. Help us to change where we need to change, to work where we need to work, and to bloom, to bear fruit in a world hungering and thirsting for your love. Amen.